everybody out there? Hope you had a good week and a beautiful day outside, a little cool, but it should be this way, correct? We're not used to that 77 degree weather unless we go south. Let's all stand this morning, turn to page 444, look at your neighbor, put on a smile, and say, we're looking forward to heaven's jubilee. Page 444, let's sing all four, three verses this morning. you have given us, dear God. We thank you for the many, many blessings you have bestowed upon us, dear God. And dear God, each one of the prayer requests, dear God, you know the need, dear God. But most of all, dear God, if there's a lost person here, dear God, just touch him before it's eternally too late. Again, dear God, just go with this service, dear God. Be with Brother Steve as he brings a message. Just give him the words we stand in need of and just prepare our hearts to receive it, dear God. And be with this offering, dear God, and help with the upbuilding of thy kingdom. And just forgive us of many sins and go with us the remainder of our lives. These saints rest thy name.
Page 504, page 504 in the Sweet Forever, the first and the last. satisfied when we are finally at home in the presence of our Savior. Amen. And each and every day and each and every week that we come in here and as I get a little older the reality begins to start getting a little closer when I look and I see those that were here, that are gone and it makes me realize that it's just a little while. It's, it's close. And we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know that we'll be satisfied when we're in the presence of Jesus. And he keeps us satisfied here. But the satisfaction he gives us through his spirit, what a day that will be when we truly, that our eyes and our faith and everything comes together and we see him. Let's do a, a course of what a day that will be. I think we all know that. Just give us a little lean right here. <coughs>
Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes during the week, just don't allow enough time to really just, to just worship him. And let's take this time this morning to thank him because he lives, amen, that we can face tomorrow. Let's do, a, let's do the first verse of the course, okay? <laughs> Let me just tell you something. God is real. My God is real. Amen. And he's real because as the song says, you ask me how I know he lives. It's because he lives within our hearts. I just pray today that you'll just allow God to be God in your life. And if there's a knock on your heart today, let me tell you something. It's real. Just listen to his voice because that is the only way that this life that we live in is going to be worth the living is having Christ in your life today. I have had the privilege of teaching singing school this week up at County Line in White County. Um, we have, every night this week, we have sang from 7 to 8.30 to 9 o'clock every night. Um, I was telling Morgan, I said, I don't know how much longer my voice will hold up. But they said something Sunday night that has stuck with me all week. They said that the how important the song service is. To me this morning, this is evidence of it. And I thank Bobby for just being faithful and Amen. doing as the Lord leads. But they said, that is the one thing that will carry with us to heaven is singing. They said, there's not going to be any more preaching because we're going to be there in heaven for Jesus. Our faith is made complete. But it says that when we get to heaven, we will sing a new song. And it is a song that the angels cannot sing. But it's one that we will be able to sing. So just worship with us today. If you know the song, sing out. But most of all, worship him because that's what it's all about. Amen. We'll do the first. 
verse 1 and 5 and 106. Verse 1 and 107 and all.
my Savior dear Back and cross by his sweet command All my burdens gone I will rest at last On the banks of the promised land Hallelujah, what a the singing this morning. Wasn't it a blessing? Great blessing. Amen. Well, I, it's good to see Mr. McGuffey back with us today, Mr. Raiden. It's good to have them back in God's house uh, with us, and it's good to see each one of you. We've been in the past several weeks uh, looking at something. I'm going to continue in that this morning, uh, but I want to make an announcement before we go uh, any further. A week from today, at Shoal Creek Baptist Church, there's going to be a deacon ordination service. And uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the presbytery is going to gather together. The service will begin at 4 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. That's at Shoal Creek uh, Baptist Church. And uh, Ross and Shirley's son, Jason, is one of the, one of the guys that's going to be ordained uh, as a deacon. I think there's, a, there's one more, uh, I believe, other than him. But that will be next Sunday afternoon. Shoal Creek Baptist Church. Presbytery will be uh, joining together at 3 o'clock. The service, actual service will be at 4 o'clock next Sunday afternoon. So if you have an opportunity to go, be a part of that. It'll be a great blessing and uh, certainly uh, be much in prayer uh, for those services. Uh, the past few weeks we've been thinking about, and I uh, had shared with you a couple of weeks ago how that I did a non-scientific survey. I surveyed some folks. Ask them what they thought about being politically correct. You hear the term a lot of times in our country uh, today about being politically correct. Got all kind of different answers, but kind of in a nutshell, uh, it was not saying or doing anything that will offend anybody in any way. And uh, so the Lord burdened our heart about uh, just the thought of being biblically correct. Uh, being biblically co correct uh, in what people want to view as a politically correct uh, society. You know, Romans chapter 3, a portion of verse number 4 says this, says, let God be true and every man a liar. Now I want to tell you what, God says what He says. And He means what He says in His book. We can't change it. His Word is forever settled in heaven. There's nothing you and I can do if we wanted to change it. We can't change the Word of God. And we better stand on God's Word. We better never compromise the Word of God. And I believe we as a nation, we have become weak uh, because of, of being or trying to be politically correct. We've seen it creep into the churches trying to be politically correct. Don't want to be offensive to anybody. Don't want to upset an apple cart or any of those things. Uh, don't want to get on anybody's toes or none of that stuff. Uh, just don't want that. Uh, you know... Uh, somebody said one time that if, if I wanted to get beat up, I'd get out in the world. And I'm going to tell you what, there's not every time that you open up the Word of God 
uh, that will make you feel good. It's not every time it will make you feel comfortable. God's Word, is, is, if He'll show you things in our lives that needs correcting, uh, it'll bring, it'll allow us to be uncomfortable until we deal with that. You know, I'm glad uh, for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. When you hear the Word of God, we read the Word of God, and, uh, and God in the person of the Holy Spirit will speak to our heart and let us know that that needs to be corrected. Something needs to be done uh, concerning that. And if God uh, will do that in our lives, and if we'll be obedient to that and make those corrections that's needed, uh, our lives will be so much better. Uh, you know, as we look in the Word of God, last week uh, we looked at creation. A lot of folks have different opinions about creation. But the Bible settles it the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And that settles it. It doesn't matter what man's opinion is, but, but God created uh, the heaven and the earth. And so we saw that God created. We saw that God uh, created everything. God created man in His likeness and His image. We saw where that man fell uh, in Genesis chapter number 3. But we also saw in the midst of that, God made a promise there uh, in Genesis chapter number 3 of a Redeemer. If you read Genesis 3.15, it tells us about that promise of that Redeemer. We saw where that uh, Satan came, or the serpent uh, came and beguiled Eve there in the garden. Uh, she partook of the fruit that she was told not uh, to partake of. Gave to Adam, he ate. They both ate. Their eyes were open. They were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. Tried to cover up their nakedness, but that just would not do. And God promised a Redeemer. If you go to the third chapter, I believe verse 21, it says God made unto them coats of skin. An innocent animal, blood was shed in order to cover up up their nakedness uh, before God. And we saw where that God also promised uh, there in Genesis chapter 3 verse number 15, He also promised the defeat of Satan, that his head would be crushed. And you know, we, we talked about that, but also uh, we kind of got a hold of this in, Re in the book of Revelation. It talked about how that he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before God ever spoke anything into existence. God already had a plan. Before anything was spoken into existence, the devil was already defeated because he was as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now let's look at something this morning. I've got two things. Uh, we think about our society today. We look around and we can see the wickedness. We can see the corruptness that, that exists in our society today. I want us to look at two things this morning, two events that are recorded here in the book of Genesis. And it's concerning wickedness and corruptness. But also, in the midst of this, I want us to think about how that in the midst of all of this, you know, God's grace and God's mercy is seen. You know, God hates sin. God despises sin. You want to know how much that God despises sin? Look at Calvary. Look at the price that was paid. Look at the cost uh, for my sin and your sin uh, to be forgiven. Uh, look at Calvary. If you want to really see what God thinks about sin. Because God gave His only begotten Son. Jesus died not for His sin or because of His sin. He died for our sin and because of our sin. He was our substitute as He died there on Calvary. So if you want to see what God thinks uh, concerning sin, look at Calvary and look at the price that was paid uh, for your redemption and for my redemption. You know, Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. There's some verses I want to share with you before we get in uh, here to Genesis. And you can jot these down. I'm going to read these to you. In Psalm 7, well let me, let me back up just a second. Think about the word corrupt. The word corrupt in original language means this. It means to decay, uh, to mar, to ruin. To decay, to mar, to ruin. The word wicked means this. In the original language, it means evil, it means evil thoughts, it means evil actions. When we think about those two words, corrupt and wickedness, that's given there in Scripture. In Psalm 711, it says this, God judges the righteous 
And God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalms 9 uh, verse uh, number 17 reads like this, and this is a very familiar verse. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. In Psalms 37 verses 34 through 36 it says, Wait on the Lord and keep His way, and He shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power, and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. The 94th Psalm, in verses 1 through 11, uh, it reads like this. It says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thy heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, you brutish among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chased, uh, uh, chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teaches man knowledge, shall, he, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. The 145th Psalm, verse 20. The Lord preserveth all them that love Him, but all the wicked will He destroy. In Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his, his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and He will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. Now you think about all of this Scripture, and what the Word of God says concerning wickedness. But I want to tell you what, I'm so thankful for the grace and mercy of God, aren't you? I'm so thankful for God's grace and God's mercy in the midst of all of this. There's two things that really stand out uh, to us early in the book of Genesis that, that takes place. The first one, if you'll go with me to Genesis chapter number 6, and we're going to read a few verses here. In Genesis chapter number 6, the Bible reads like this, beginning in verse number 5. It says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Skip down to verse 11 and 12. It says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted His way upon the earth. God saw. Think about this. Back in, in verse number 5, it says, And God saw. Notice those words. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And if you'll look down also in verse number 12, it says, And God looked upon the earth. There's not one single thing going on that God's not aware of. There's not one single thing happening that God is not aware of. But I want you to notice in the midst of the wickedness, in the midst of the ungodliness, notice verse number 8 of chapter number 6. It says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of all of the ungodliness, the wickedness, and the corruptness that was going on, the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Look at verse number 9. It says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. 
A lot of times when we think about somebody walking with God, we think about Enoch. You know, the Bible says Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. But the Scripture says here, and Noah walked with God. You know what Amos 3.3 3 says? The Amos 3.3 3, uh, says this. You think about this. Can two walk together except they be agreed? You know what? Noah was in agreement with God. And God was in agreement with Noah. He said he was a just man. He was a perfect man. doesn't mean he was without sin. But Noah knew. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis 7, 1, look, look at what the Lord said concerning Noah. The Lord, you know, the, the Lord instructed him. It says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. In the midst of the wickedness, in the midst of corruptness, in the midst of it all, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord said this of Noah. He said, I've seen you righteous before me in this generation. In verse number 5 of chapter 7, Notice something that Noah did. It says, And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was obedient unto the Lord. Down in verse number 21, you know, if you'll read all of this, and you've read the Scripture, how that God instructed Noah on building the ark because He was going to destroy man and every living creature from off the face of the earth because of their wickedness, because of the corruptness in the earth. God's judgment was coming upon that. But we find where that Noah did exactly what God told him to do. In verse 21 of chapter 7, it says, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. They died. God's judgment came. But notice chapter 8, verse number 1. It says, And God remembered Noah. Noah and his family were safe inside the ark. Study out Scripture and you'll find that that ark is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Noah and his family was safe and secure. When God spoke to Noah, when Noah had completed the ark, and God spoke to Noah and He said, Come thou and thy family into the ark. That told me that God was already in the ark. He said, Come thou and thy family into the ark. There was no way that that ark was going down. No way. And the Bible says, And God remembered Noah. God remembered him. The one that had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It says, And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters a sage. Think about this. God remembered Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. If you'll go in the middle of chapter number 8, God speaks to Noah and tells him uh, to go forth from the ark. Him, his wives, his sons, and his son's wives with them. And they were to bring forth all the living creatures out of the ark. And the Bible said in verse number 20, listen to this, Then Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said unto in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything as I've done. And you remember how that God made a covenant. And he said, I'm going to set my bow in the cloud. And that was a reminder that God would no longer destroy the earth by a flood. Look at verse number 22 of chapter 8. God said this, said, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. How many of you have ever heard somebody make this statement? They'll say, well, you know, the Bible tells us in the last days you won't be able to tell one season from another. Anybody ever 
ever said that? I'm going to tell you what, it ain't in the book. It's not in the book. If you go to, to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, God said this. He said, while the earth remaineth, He said, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. It'll continue. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of wickedness, in the midst of corruptness, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Second thing I want you to notice this morning, go to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis 13, and listen to this. Genesis 13, the Bible said this, beginning in verse number 8. It says, And Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. It's not the whole land before thee. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But I want you to notice verse 13, what the Scripture says. It says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Abraham and Lot separate. Lot makes a choice by sight. He saw that it was well watered and he chose the plain. He pitches his tent toward Sodom, the Scripture says. If you go to Genesis chapter number 18, you'll find where that the Lord, because of the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Lord is going to destroy that place. And in chapter number 18, He tells Abraham concerning this. Look in verse 17 of chapter 18 of Genesis. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, And all the eight nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he'll command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he's spoken unto him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. And because their sin is very grievous. I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. And the Bible said the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. If you'll read these next verses, verses 23 through 33, you'll find where Abraham begins to intercede for Sodom. He begins and he asks, asks the Lord if he was go, would he destroy the righteous with the wicked. He said, if there's 50 righteous there, will you destroy it? He asked him again, he said, well, if there, uh, if there be, uh, if I find 50, you know, the Lord told him if I find 50, I'll spare the place. Abraham begins to ask him again. He says, what if there be lack five of the 50? He says, will thou destroy the city for lack of five? And he said, if I find there 40 and 5, I'll not destroy it. He said, what if there's 40 found there? And he said, I'll not do it for 40's sake. He said, what if, what if, you know, if there's 30 be found there? And he said, I'll not do it if I find 30 righteous there. And he said, you know, if, if we get there and, and, and there's, he said, there be 20 found there. And he said, I'll not destroy it for 20's sake. And he said in verse 32, he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I'll speak yet, but this once, peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I'll not destroy it for ten's sake. The Lord went his way as soon as he left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Abraham interceded for Sodom. Over in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 16, listen 
to verse 49 and 50. It says, Behold, this is the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 3, very familiar scripture. Listen uh, to these words. Isaiah chapter number 3. And the Bible says in verses 8 and 9, For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. To show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. In both instances, we see the corruptness and the wickedness. But in the midst of it all, we find that where Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. If you'll study out Scripture, you'll find that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And over in Second Peter, in the book of Second Peter, chapter number 2, and I want you to listen to what the Scripture says here. In, in 2 Peter, chapter number 2, verse number 5, it reads like this. Well, let's read verses 4. It says, For if God spare not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the one that found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. He saved Noah. Noah that had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah that was just in his generation and in his day, in a time of wickedness, a time of corruptness, Noah still found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I'm glad for that. But I want you to notice something concerning Lot. Lot. In 2 Peter chapter number 2, listen to this. It says in verse number 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed, listen to this, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul, from day to day were their unlawful deeds. Lot vexed his righteous soul. One of the, when I did the survey on political correctness, one of them said that in in their response said this, as far as the church is concerned, the church, the political correctness had crept into the church and how that the church was getting used to the dark. Lot, if you'll study out his life, he got used to what was going on in Sodom. And the scripture said he vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation that went on in that place. And But you think about this. Lot, in Genesis chapter 19, he goes to his son-in-laws when the Lord told him he was going to destroy the place. And the Bible said he went and he told them that God's judgment was coming and God was going to destroy uh, that place. And in verse 14 it said, Lot went out, spake to his son-in-laws which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. And notice what happens. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Lot lost his testimony. Lot lost his effectiveness because he had vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation that was going on in that place. But I want you to notice something else in, verse, in chapter number 19. And I want you to notice what the Lord told Lot. Lot was reluctant in leaving. Read the whole chapter, you'll see. But notice what the Lord told Lot in verse 22. He says, Haste thee, escape thither, 
For I cannot do anything till thou become thither. In the midst of both of these instances, the Bible talks about how wicked and how corrupt the world had become, how wicked and corrupt that Sodom and Gomorrah had had become. In the midst of all of that, as bad as the world was, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. As bad as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was still a just man. Lot, before God's judgment came, Lot had to be gotten out of that place. The Lord said, I can't do anything till I get you out of here. Now I hear a lot of different things from people and they'll talk about, you know, when's the church going to be raptured? Is the church going to go through tribulation? All this stuff. I'm going to tell you this. The Bible tells us that He's not appointed us to wrath as a child of God. He's not appointed us to wrath. As bad as it got for Lot, he was sitting in the gate of Sodom, the Scripture said. As bad as it got. You know what? The Lord said, before I destroy this place, I've got to get you out of here. Even the question was asked. Abraham asked the question. Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? As bad as it was. And even even though Lot had vexed his righteous soul with the filthy conversation that went on, he was still a child of God. He was still a child of God. And before God's judgment and destruction came upon that place, God got him out. And I'm, I'm not looking for an undertaker today. I'm not looking for an undertaker to get my body. I hope an undertaker never don't make a dime off of me. After I, having them bomb me or whatever they do. Now, they, our kids have already told us they're taking us out back and just drop us off the bank behind the house. And if they do, that's all right for me. It's okay. I'm not looking for an undertaker. I'm looking for an uppertaker today. I know the Lord's coming back. And I know this world's bad that you and I live in. This is a wicked world. But you know what? There's people today that are finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. There's people today that God is speaking to and God is dealing with and drawing them out of that wickedness and changing their lives. You want to, you don't know what the greatest miracle it ever is. It's a life that's been changed by the power of God. That's the greatest miracle. We've got people that have sickness. We've got people that's got ailments and all those things. Some of you sitting here uh, in this building, you're a miracle. I mean, it's only by God, um, a touch of God on your life that you're still here and you're sitting in this place today. And you're a miracle. But the greatest miracle that's ever been done is when a man, woman, a boy or girl comes and gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ and they're changed. They're no longer the same. He don't change just the outside. He changes us from inside out. And I'm going to tell you what, when somebody gets saved, you'll know it. You'll know it. You'll, there's a difference. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's a new walk. There's a new talk. There's a new direction in our lives. Don't mean we won't mess up. I mess up every day. We don't mean we won't mess up. It don't mean we're no longer a child of God. You know, probably if you could talk to Lot today, and you could ask Lot, say, Lot, if you could change anything in your life, what would it be? And I believe Lot would probably say this, I wish I'd never pitched my tent towards Sodom. That's probably what he'd say. Wished I'd never pitched my tent towards Sodom. There's a lot of people today, a lot of God's people today, that have pitched their tent towards Sodom. But you know, I'm glad that God is full of mercy and God is full of grace. If we got what we deserved this morning, every one of us would be in hell right now if we got what we deserved. But I'm glad we've gotten something we don't deserve, and that's the grace of God. What a blessing to be a child of God. Let's stand our feet this morning. Don't know how God may have spoken to your heart in this place today. I do know this. There's not one single thing going on in our lives 
Not one single thing we're dealing with in our lives that God can't handle. He can handle it. Regardless of where we are in our spiritual walk with Him. You know, we may be walking with God just like Noah did. You know, he walked with God. We may be in total agreement with God. But on the other hand, we may be like Lot. And we've kind of pitched our tent in another direction. Maybe God's spoken to your heart this morning. I'm glad that God's grace and God's mercy is sufficient. It is sufficient uh, today for whatever need. Whatever needs you have in your life today, God will meet that need if you'll allow Him to do so. If you're here this morning, you've never been saved by God's grace. Come to Him and be saved. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. I don't set a date. But I'm going to tell you this, He is coming. And He's coming for those that are ready to meet Him. That's where He's coming for. You ready to meet Him? If He came today, would that be alright? I'm going to tell you what, it'd be alright with me. It'd be alright with me. I don't know what your heart's need is, but I do know this, the Lord does. This altar's open, the invitation's open. Bobby, if y'all will come on. Just be obedient to the Lord. You want to come and pray, you come. Be obedient to the Lord. What's your number, Bob? 550. Amen.